So I was. I was the first one through the door with my, uh, I felt pretty, you know, pretty good, pretty, uh, pretty hot with my uh, Ruger 357. And I kicked the door and I was scared shitless when I was confronting um, that guy that I had been buying the dope from. He had a sword, a samurai sword held over his head. And he was about, I don't know, I want to say three to four feet away from me. And his blade was right in line with my forehead. And so my, my trigger finger started to squeeze. And, um, and then suddenly he just dropped it. The sword dropped it behind his back. But it was also a reminder that had he already been coming forward with the sword, I probably would have shot him and still got split in half uh, with, his, with his sword. So it was a, remi a reminder to me that when you have a gun, as a law enforcement officer, be ready to shoot. And that was probably a situation when I would have been uh, justified at shooting, shooting him. And uh, so that was uh, kind of the beginning of my, of my uh, exciting law enforcement career. <laughs>
ended up uh, going into the Army, enlisting in the Army, and then coming out and joining the police department, became a police officer in an incorporated city within San Diego County called National City uh, Police Department. And it was, of all the incorporated cities, it was probably one of the more violent uh, towns. So my brother, at a very young age, um, fulfilled one of his, uh, his dreams of being uh, a cop. And uh, f again, four years behind him, I ended up uh, going from high school to college, graduated with a bachelor's degree, and then uh, went into the Navy. So although I wanted to be a policeman, that was my uh, dream as, as well as a kid. Uh, it wasn't until I got into college that I realized, hey, I could do something, uh, you know, before I become a police officer or a federal agent. So I was recruited and uh, it was suggested that I take the, the pilot exam. Uh, landing on, taking off and landing on carriers seemed pretty exciting. So I did. Um, I joined the Navy. I went to Pensacola and went through their, uh, their basic uh, officer program, which is called Aviation Officer Candidate School. Um, got my commission as an ensign and went to flight school. Started flying and after about a year into it, I was not physically qualified to continue because of uh, diminishing eyesight. So they offered me an opportunity to get out or ju jump in the back seat. I wasn't too crazy about that. Or they said I could go on a ship. I was newly married. Uh, my wife was due uh, with our first child. So I wasn't crazy about that. So I decided to get out. While I was uh, processing out of, out of the Navy, uh, active duty, I was uh, able to um, work and assist the local office of the Naval Investigative Service. So it, they are civilian agents, but um, they take on officers to, to help out in, in, in various instances. So I did that for a couple months. They encouraged me to apply. I did. Uh, upon uh, moving back to San Diego from Florida, I was hired, uh, went to their academy, which was Glencoe, Georgia, and then started working at uh, San Diego's Naval Station, which was all of our uh, naval uh, ships were parked. So, Mike, before you go on, and so two specific things. First of all, what were you flying? Were you flying helicopters, uh, jets? What were you in the Navy? No, I... I wanted to fly jets, obviously, okay. but <laughs> that was the ultimate goal. But okay. uh, during flight school, I was in uh, primary uh, flight flight training, okay. and we were flying a T thirty four, okay, uh, B Bravo, and um, it was a it was a turboprop basically, and so we were flying out of Whiting, um, and depending upon your grades, the needs of the Navy, uh, they would they would have then sent me to either helicopter training um, or large aircraft, turboprop, um, or jets, depending upon the grade. Okay, so you never really, really got to that point because of your eyesight. I never got out to the squadrons, never completed flight school, okay. so I was afforded the opportunity okay. to get out of the Navy. Okay, so getting back to my original question, though, specifically for you, was there something that happened, something that, you know, besides playing cops and robbers as a kid, was there anything that was the impetus about you going into law enforcement or, or having that desire to do it? Um, well, first of all, my parents were both basically uneducated. They had to go to night school to get their, their high school certificates. Um, I grew up in a very patriotic family. Um, there was um, a lot of encouragement about taking a government job, whether it be local, state, or federal. Um, so that was uh, encouraged, and that, that sense of patriotism. Now, so on one hand, it was a patriotic thing to do. On the other hand, we wanted to have some fun and have an adventurous life. And so, you know, the military and uh, police work afforded that opportunity. Okay. And so in 84, getting back to your timeline here, 84, you start with... NIS, which most people will now know as NCIS, which is the Naval and Criminal Intelligence Service? Investigative that? Service. Investigative yeah. Service. Okay. And so what were your duties there? What did you do? Basically, we investigate crimes uh, committed on and off base by Navy and Marine Corps personnel. 
So uh, when I started, uh, I took an immediate interest in working the drug cases. And in those days, uh, talking about the, the early, early mid 80s, methamphetamine was a big deal. Uh, blotter acid or LSD was a big deal. Not so much marijuana and not so much cocaine, but I was doing a lot of undercover work. I, I actually uh, got to go off base, work with uh, San Diego's uh, local street team, narcotic street team, together with DEA. And, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time together. Uh, I was, I had a short hair, so I was the Navy guy buying the dope. And, uh, and, and I liked it. And I, I realized from talking to the DEA guy, that is what I want to do. So um, I had a lot of fun and was convinced ultimately to put an application in with uh, DEA. How old were you with, with uh, NIS? Um, 23, 24. Okay, so 23, 24, when you start doing your first undercover, how does that feel? Are you nervous? Are you scared? Are you... Tell me how that works as a, as a young man trying your first undercover. Yeah, yeah, I was scared. <laughs> I was asked and expected to go inside homes by myself, close the door. Uh, sometimes I was wired, sometimes I wasn't, dependent upon well, whether we thought the crooks were going to search me or not. Um, I remember in one case I was buying some marijuana and some LSD from some guy, and uh, he was always high when I was dealing with him. So that was a case that comes to mind because that was my first opportunity to be able to write a wire, or, um, a search warrant affidavit. So I wrote the search warrant, uh, was approved by the judge, and they let me be the first one through the door. So, uh, so I was, I was the first one through the door with my, uh, I felt pretty, you know, pretty good, pretty, pretty hot with my uh, Ruger 357. And I kicked the door and I was scared shitless when I was confronting um, that guy that I had been buying the dope from. He had a sword, a samurai sword, held over his head. And he was about, I don't know, I want to say three to four feet away from me. And his blade was right in line with my forehead. And so my, my trigger finger started to squeeze and... Um, and then suddenly he just dropped it. The sword dropped it behind his back. But it was also a reminder that had he already been coming forward with the sword, I probably would have shot him and still got split in half uh, with, his, with his sword. So it was a, remi a reminder to me that when you have a gun, as a law enforcement officer, be ready to shoot. And that was probably a situation when I would have been uh, justified at shooting shooting him. And uh, so that was uh, kind of the beginning of my, of my uh, exciting law enforcement career. Okay, so then you, you apply to DEA, and I'm assuming you're not applying to anybody else. You're just applying to DEA. That was it. That was, uh, I wanted to work drugs. I also wanted to be with an agency that went outside the United States and, and worked in foreign countries, and DEA was everywhere. Okay. So in 85, you start with DEA and you eventually, once you uh, graduate from uh, Quantico, you get back to San Diego. Uh, that's where your, your first station. Can you tell me what are you working on in 85 as a brand new agent? Well, I uh, went to uh, Quantico. We were the third or fourth class in Quantico. It, Quantico had historically been the FBI's academy um, exclusively, but we joined up with the FBI. They gave us uh, permission to uh, train our agents there. So I came out of, uh, out of the class in April, went back to San Diego, which was my, my, my home base, and was assigned to Colexco, uh, which is a, a border office located a couple hours drive east of uh, San Diego, over the mountains, into the desert, in an area called Imperial County, and it's uh, located, it's rock throwing distance to uh, Mexico, Mexicali specifically, which is the uh, uh, capital of Baja, California. So months before I reported to Colexco as a rookie agent, I was just tagging along. Uh, I was given my own car, 
So I would help out with surveillances. And I remember one particular case sticks in my, in my mind. We were uh, following around a, uh, a Bolivian drug trafficker and we didn't know who he was, but we knew that our agents in Panama had been dealing directly with him to, uh, to move cocaine through Panama or into Panama and then from Panama into San Diego. So that undercover agent in Panama introduced our undercover agent in San Diego and our undercover agent in San Diego invited the Bolivian up to San Diego and wined and dined him. So we were following him around from club to club, which was kind of cool. It reminded me of uh, Miami Vice and uh, felt like, you know, we were, uh, we were doing the Lord's work. So I will in a while come back to this story because there's something significant that I want to mention about that Bolivian trafficker later on. Okay. Throughout your career, you end up developing an expertise in Latin American narcotics trafficking. And there was a story that you told me about you and your dad uh, growing up, which kind of became relevant in all your dealings, especially with, uh, with your time in Mexico. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I grew up in San Diego. My father, obviously, being uh, a native of uh, Costa Rica, native Spanish speaker, we would go down to Tijuana, uh, and he would take me or my brother or both of us, and we'd get our hair cut, we'd get cheese, we'd buy piñatas, whatever he, you know, whatever we needed, we'd go down to Tijuana. Um, and I recall driving around in, T in Tijuana and being stopped by a motorcycle cop. And I think I was in the front seat. Uh, and as the cop approached, my dad pulled his wallet out. He had his driver's license and it might have been a $10, $20 bill. It's probably 10 in the 60s. I was seven or eight at the time. And all I remember was the cop uh, taking his wallet, taking the 10, uh, not even pulling out the driver's license and handing it back to my dad. And uh, I looked at my dad and he looked at me and just smiled and nothing was said about it. And it wasn't until I started getting older and of course dealing professionally, I realized, hey, <laughs> this is how it works in Mexico. It's called, you know, corruption. And um, that was my introduction. So when I reported to Colexco, um, it was in a day during a time when DEA had no presence along the border inside of Mexico. So it, U.S. agents, DEA agents assigned to border offices were required and, uh, and encouraged to go into Mexico to work with Mex feds. As border agents, they used to call us border rats. Um, and we would go into Mexico and while I was in Colexico, um, we'd go at least every other day and we would do everything from eat lunch to uh, kick doors and and uh, that was when I first experienced undercover operations in Mexico where I was allowed to do the undercover work. Um, we would uh, roll around with the Mexicans and we would uh, execute search warrants, help them make arrests. Um, in a couple of instances we got in car chases and in one instance, uh, that was where I experienced my first shooting. Not me personally, but I was involved in, a, in, a, uh, in an incident that, where we hit a ranch that was uh, believed to be stash, a stash place for a couple few tons of marijuana. It turned out it was. Uh, the Quintero uh, family owned it and ran, uh, was running the operation. They shot at us as we approached, or we had a caravan of five or six vehicles. Um, nobody on our, on the good guy end got shot, but uh, one of the Quintero family members, a, a distant cousin, was shot and killed. So explain this to me, Mike, because I've done undercover. Uh, you kind of grow into it. You get used to it. You know, your nerves settle a little bit. I can't imagine doing undercover in Mexico. How, how was that? I think I'd be scared shitless doing undercover in Mexico. Uh, it was scary uh, because, you know, we're trained a certain way uh, in, in, when we're attending the academy. 
and there are certain protocols that we follow. But once I reported to Colexco and, uh, you know, we crossed that international borderline, the world just uh, flipped upside down. And uh, it was uh, like nothing we had ever, uh, or at least me as a rookie, had never experienced or been trained to, uh, to, uh, to experience. And so there were basically no rules in Mexico. I didn't know where my cover team was. Um, I wasn't wired most of the time. Um, it, it, was, it was kind of a wild, wild ride. Most of what I was buying was heroin, and I was encouraged to be the gringo who was looking for some heroin or, or weed or coke or a little bit of both. And, uh, you know, I was told to give the bus signal. And in some cases, I told, I gave the bus signal, and uh, it seemed like an eternity. Nobody showed up, and I, I had the pucker factor of about 100%. And um, anyway, but it was fun. Yeah, so explain a little bit to me about how <laughs> we don't have any presence in Mexico at the time, but you're still encouraged to go into Mexico, work with the Mex feds and everything else. What, I mean, what were the rules back then? I mean, it's, it seems like the Wild West. Are you, allowed to, are you allowed to carry a gun? Does the United States government realize you're carrying a gun? Are the Mexican, obviously, the Mex feds are okay with you coming across the border. Explain that relationship to me. So um, there were a lot, of, when I reported to Colexico, there were a lot of sensitivities still with Mexico, um, given the Camarena, uh, our special agent, um, Enrique Kiki Camarena being kidnapped, tortured, and, and found his body found uh, in February of 1985. And then when I reported, shortly after reporting August 86, another agent out of Guadalajara, Victor Cortez, was basically uh, uh, held against his will, was picked up while he was meeting with an informant, was, uh, for all practical purposes, was arrested, placed in custody, and was tortured for eight hours. He made it out alive. Um, the agents uh, in Guadalajara uh, figured out where he was, went to his rescue, got the ambassador involved, got the governor involved. So there were a lot of sensitivities. Having said that, um, we still had to go down and work with the Mexican Federal Judicial Police. There, But working in Mexico, I learned that everything is gray, gray area. There's no white, there's no black. Um, the rules are on the books, but they're rarely followed. Um, a lot of times we, for example, we were a border office, so we would respond to uh, seizures at the port of entry. Many times the, the defendants we would encounter were um, Mexican nationals with no ties to the United States. In those days, we were allowed to call the U.S. Attorney's Office and get a declination of prosecution in which case they provided us the declination authorization. And then we would call Mex Freds and we'd say, hey, we've got one for you. We ended up kicking them back into Mexico and we would go to Mexico and work, um, you know, work the investigation. It usually uh, may have started out a couple hundred pounds of weed and ended up, you know, multiple kilos of heroin, a ton of weed uh, after a few hours of interrogation. Not us doing the interrogating, but the Mexicans. And of course, we were always uh, asked to leave the room, but we had a feel about uh, what was going on. Um, none of us were, were deaf. And uh, before you know it, we were running around with the Mexicans, kicking doors and uh, making arrests, seizing dope, and then uh, eating whatever the, uh, the traffickers had on the you know, had on the stove. That was just the way it was done in, in Mexico in the day. We didn't know any difference. Um, and we did ask, and I remember here over here in a conversation, hey, if we get in a shooting, we end up shooting a bad guy, what do we do? Because well, we're not supposed to have guns down here. At least we didn't think we were supposed to have guns. And they said, no, 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 worry. We sh we'll shoot them. We shot them. You don't have anything to worry about. You can just go back home. It's no big deal. So that was my exposure as a rookie to Mexico. How um, we talked a little bit about this. Um, you said there was a story uh, basically about a commandante being a little heavy handed. Can you tell that story? 
<laughs> yeah. Um, besides the, the routine investigative techniques or uh, interrogative techniques that were, uh, that were used, I remember on one, in one instance we were, we were started out looking for a, a stash house and we had to stop by um, a particular home and, and grab a couple individuals and take them as defendants to the major stash house. When we rolled up, it was like four or five o'clock in the morning. Um, of course, we were all together in the same van with the Mex Feds. We jumped out, and one of the 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 Mexican agents in front of me tripped, and and he let um, like a three round burst from his AK forty seven went into the house. Well, that stirred uh, stirred up the house, woke everybody up. And an older woman, well, to me, she was older. She was in her 40s or early 50s. She came out screaming at the comandante. His name was uh, Guillermo Robles Lisiaga. I remember it well. Rest in peace. He, he, he passed in, uh, uh, afterward uh, some years later. But uh, she was screaming at him, came right up to his face, and uh, he just listened to her and listened to her, and then all of a sudden... She nearly hit the ground, and of course, all of us U.S. agents, were, uh, our mouths were open. We didn't say anything, but uh, that was again. You know, we realized we ain't in Kansas anymore, and it was just uh, you know how things worked in Mexico. So, Mike, I had a question about uh, Mexico. How difficult was it as a U.S. agent working in Mexico? with the corruption? That's a good question. And, and in Mexico, you know, more than any other Latin American country uh, in which I, I had worked, um, most of my experience is, is with Mexico. And I reflected back during my rookie years uh, running around Mexicali, um, and even though years had gone by, nothing really changed. Uh, corruption was still the same. Um, in, in Mexico, when I when I transferred from Costa Rica to become the resident agent in charge of our Guadalajara office, and uh, I realized one thing, a very important thing. It's not DEA and and I think U.S. government in general. We like to uh, find that secret weapon individual with whom we can lock arms and go after all the bad guys, and that has just never happened. It will never happen. Uh, uh, in Mexico because it is not about the individual, it's about the system. And uh, ever since Cortez landed and the Span Spaniards had their way uh, in, in Mexico, corruption is the grease that keeps the machine in operation. And uh, I call it the land of favors. Nothing is done in Mexico without expecting something in return. And that something in return in Mexico is money. Um, and I don't want to paint a picture uh, of all of Mexico is bad. Mexico is a beautiful country. The people are wonderful. By and large, they're honest, law-abiding, decent, hardworking people. And, uh, you know, they're being tormented by a vicious group of organized thugs. And those organized thugs are making billions of dollars and are able to influence the predispo predisposed government officials. And those government officials are the same thing as the elite businessmen. It's a small core of people that run everything in that country. And of course, the drug traffickers have become so violent that um, there's no way to get, uh, get control of it. Um, so it's a, it's a state in crisis. Uh, the violence has, has reached proportions that, uh, that are just undescribable. Nobody really is safe anywhere in Mexico, from Cancun to Tijuana. It is a dangerous country to, to be a tourist in. Um, and another thing that I want to say along having said that is the policemen, the federal policemen that I've worked with in Mexico, many of them are good men. And what I learned was they start out idealistically to be cops, to go after the bad guys, to do exactly what we do 
here in this country. And in fact, many times I could feel their envy. Um, and, but, you know, they respect the differences. Uh, and what they respected in us, at least in my case, was that I didn't look, my down, look down my nose at them um, because I, I made it aware that I realized they were working um, within the system that they were given. And those uh, individuals that get promoted within that system um, are corrupt. Uh, they wouldn't be at their, have their positions unless they were playing the game. And, uh, and working within the system. And I don't have enough fingers and toes to count the number of individuals that we placed all of our trust in in Mexico that turned out being, um, you know, bad guys in league with uh, major drug traffickers. I mean, the most recent example is Hernando Garcia Luna uh, that I, you know, I dealt with personally, uh, interacted with him. Of course, he was not at my level, but uh, I interacted with him and had information that he was corrupt, but uh, and so did our our leadership. But unless you have a smoking gun, uh, there's nothing you can do about it. But what happens in Mexico is you replace him with another individual who was brought up, came up through the same system, and uh, that's what we're dealing with in Mexico. So throughout your career, you really develop an expertise about Latin American drug trafficking. Can you tell me what? What really stuck out to you about Latin American drug traffickers? Well, first of all, uh, Mexico became um, a fascinating study for me as a drug enforcement agent. Not only, um, you know, when the Camarena uh, incident occurred, when he was abducted, it, it just filled me with a lot of anger. And, uh, and, I, and I felt like I wanted to be part of that drug war. And so that was really where my passion started. Um, but while I was assigned to Colexco, uh, I got a chance to get involved in an operation called Snowcap. And that was uh, a paramilitary operation where DEA joined forces with uh, DOD and the State Department uh, to send uh, agents, trained agents, uh, down to South America, namely the source countries like Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, to work with the counterparts uh, doing para paramilitary operations. The idea was to uh, get the cocaine shut down at the source. So um, I started, I, I went through a series of, of training evolutions, uh, went back and forth to Quantico, was trained by the Marine Corps, uh, some by the Navy, some by the Army, Special Forces, and, uh, and then we started doing 90-day tours down in South America. So, Mike, before you go on about that, I was always under the impression, and maybe it changed over the years, I was always under the impression that you guys not did the full Ranger, uh, Ranger training, but you guys went through some sort of Ranger training, and once you passed, that allowed you to go down and do these missions. Did, was that ever part of what you, you did, and did that change over the years, if you know, for SOD, or not SOD, but Snowcap? Yes, it started out where, well, they wanted us trained in everything from, um, you know, operational tactics to um, survival, demolition, communications. So we were sent to Quantico. We worked with the Marines to learn how to navigate through the jungle. So we were given a compass and, uh, and we learned how to um, set an azimuth, a direction uh, off of a map, learn how to pace count so we could f locate very various objectives um, geographically over land and determine we were where we were at all times. We learned how communications, we learned how to set up uh, ex military expedient uh, antennas so that we could communicate long distance. We learned how to uh, set explosives so we could um, uh, destroy clandestine airstrips that were used to move large amounts of cocaine. Um, in 1988, I uh, attended a one-month uh, course, uh, jungle, jungle operations in 
in the country of Panama at uh, the U.S. base at Fort Sherman. Uh, it normally, it was taught by a regular army assigned to JOTC, J uh, Jungle Operation Training Center. However, in this case, 7th Special Forces Group uh, uh, came down to administer uh, or conduct the training. So since we were going to be working with them throughout uh, and even down in South America, they, uh, it was uh, decided that, that we should be trained by them specifically. We even um, learned how to give ourselves IVs, which came in handy, of course, because when we were in the jungle and not operating, we'd get, uh, you know, a little, we have a little too much uh, on a Friday night, and uh, those IVs came in handy. <laughs> Can you talk about, <laughs> once you start doing your operations, your 90-day TDYs on snowcap, wh what are you doing? We are um, going out. Uh, working in a forward operating base, in this particular case, I was assigned to the Chapari, which was uh, um, in the jungle. And uh, from there, we would interview informants. We would uh, uh, set up a, uh, an operation, um, military style, and then we would go out with counterparts. In this particular case, um, they were called Umapar, which is nothing more than uh, the rural police that was trained to conduct, you know, counter drug uh, operations. And we would go out and we would look for paste labs. Uh, there were there are three stages of the cocaine uh, manufacture or production. There's the paste converted to base, and then final stage is HCL. HCL is what you see in the bricks, uh, in brick form um, when it gets up to the United States. So we would go out looking for paste and base labs, and uh, we would jump in Huey helicopters, you know, Vietnam era helicopters, and we'd fly around uh, heading towards our target locations, or we would go by river uh, in, uh, you know, um, small, small boat craft. Um, we flew around in Spanish-made, they called them casas, uh, C-212. We had one um, crash in 93 or 94 in Peru, killed um, uh, uh, several of our agents, two of them I, I knew very well. Um, flying around uh, Bolivia and Peru and Colombia was always uh, inherently dangerous, besides the traffickers that we, uh, that we sometimes would encounter. Why was it inherently dangerous? Was it just the, the weather? Was it uh, you're not flying around with experienced pilots? I mean, what was it about it? All the pilots were U.S. trained. Okay. They were excellent. The helicopter pilots were outstanding. There were never any incidents. The only incidents that we had was sometimes their, um, their small aircraft, their fixed wing, or uh, mainly their fixed wing. They would lose the communication or their ability to... Uh, geographically uh, navigate so we'd get lost and in some cases we did get lost had to land and then we would set up using a, a, a portable um, a Vietnam era prick 77 radio we'd have to set up uh, an expedient antenna and communicate with our own guys but the dangers were the regions that we would travel in were mountainous uh, the weather um, you know, our own pilots were were not intimately familiar with the terrain, so mm. there was always some degree of of, of danger um, when when flying around, yep. you know, terrain. Yeah. So, Snowcap to me seems like a pretty effective program. You guys are going out, you're taking out these cocaine labs. Um, what was your impression? Do you feel like you were making a difference? And then ultimately, Snowcap eventually gets shut down. Do you have any? Do you have any, any knowledge of why that program was eventually shut down? Um, first of all, whenever DEA changes uh, leadership, there's always a, a different opinion and a different approach to what what we should be doing as an agency. Globally, um, that's our job to work internationally to shut down cocaine trafficking or any you know, international drug operation and shoot and, and target at the highest levels. In Bolivia's case, which is what I was most familiar with, um, we, were, we, were, we were effective. In fact, um, between the State Department 
uh, and the DEA and other or D, the various DOD um, agencies that we were working with. And we worked with everybody from um, uh, the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Army. Um, the Army um, was down there training, training uh, the counter drug elements. We were pushing cocaine labs further and further out towards the Brazilian border. Um, because of everything the State Department was doing with crop rotation and substitution, we were slowly convincing the Bolivian farmers that there was a choice uh, that they could go other than cocaine. Um, so by the time I left in 1994, I think we were having a significant impact and we could see that by the way the laps were moving further and further out. What brought the uh, snowcap operation to an end was probably the plane crash that occurred in Peru uh, in that C-212, um, that CASA, killing all, all the agents on board and the pilot crew, obviously. Uh, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. We had new leadership. That leadership was looking at placing more resources domestically and getting uh, you know, out of the foreign business. Uh, not altogether, but at least that operation was uh, on its way out. Okay. Somewhere in there, and I want to circle back to that initial story that you told in the beginning about following on, around that Bolivian. But it, it, And you tell me if this is when it happens, but somewhere in there, 90 to 94, you get uh, stationed in La Paz, Bolivia. Is this when you come back in contact with him? Yes. So um, I reported to the embassy in 1990, and instead of working paramilitary operations, my focus was conducting international investigations with the uh, Bolivian counterparts who were, you know, joined forces with us to uh, work bilateral cases at the highest levels. So at, at one point towards my, the end of my tour, it was 93, I believe, we started targeting um, their kingpins and developing enough evidence to, to to go out and grab them. And Mike, just just so you can explain it to the audience, what are what's kingpins? What are kingpins at the time? Kingpins, and I can name name off a few. Um, uh, Isaac Chavarria, he was a, a a pilot, a captain in their Bolivian army. Um, but a kingpin was like a, their Pablo Escobar of uh, a Bolivia. But these, these were basically, it's a program or it's a moniker that DEA uses to target the highest echelon. And, and DEA was naming these specific targets as kingpins, head of the organizations. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, correct. We referred to them as kingpins um, because we were looking to identify the individuals who were responsible for running you know, cocaine operations at the highest levels. And they were reclusive and hard to get to, um, but with uh, pressure, developing evidence uh, and intelligence from informants, we, we were able to build our cases. Okay, and so getting back to the, the guy that you were following around initially uh, in the beginning, the Bolivian, how did you run across that guy again? Well, we had targeted five uh, of the biggest fish in Bolivia, so to speak. And um, we went out and started grabbing them. One of the guys we got our hands on, his name was Carmelo Meco Dominguez. And when we arrested him, there was something that I just couldn't put my finger on. I thought I'd, I had seen him before. And uh, when we sat him down and started to interview him with our Bolivian counterparts, it struck me that he was the same individual we were following around in San Diego. So um, I thought, hey, this is a small world. <laughs> <laughs> so there was, a little, there was a little phrase that you used when we were talking about uh, Colombians. So the Colombians at the time, they were, they were the source of supply for all the cocaine. Uh, and that eventually transitions from the Caribbean to Mexico. But at the time when the Colombians are the main sources of supply. Can you tell me what the saying was? <laughs> so both Peru and, and, uh, and, and Bolivia 
fed the Colombian uh, machine. And the Colombian machine at the time was run by the Medellin cartel, run by Pablo Escobar. And there were, there, the, again, most of this coke was going through the Caribbean corridor. And there was so much of it, um, and this we're talking about what started with um, Griselda Blanco in that era, the cocaine cowboy era. Um, it was Colombians. All the cocaine, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, is Colombian, Colombian. So there was a saying that uh, not all Colombians are, co are, are drug traffickers, but all drug traffickers are indeed Colombian. And uh, obviously the, uh, the key to that story is that they were the major drug traffickers, um, you know, filling the world with coke. Yeah, and later on that same saying basically gets, gets transferred to the Mexicans as, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, they then become the major traffickers in the world. Yes, they did. So at one point, so from 98 to 2001, you actually are stationed in Costa Rica. Can you tell me what the difference of working in Costa Rica, and maybe there wasn't a difference, but can you tell me, what, was there any difference working in Costa Rica as opposed to Mexico and Bolivia, uh, Mexico and Bolivia? I mean, it seems, it seems like a completely, and it is a completely different country, but how is it working in Costa Rica? Okay, just to differentiate, uh, to give you a flavor mm -hmm. of what it was like to work in, our charter changes depended upon the country we're in. And Bolivia, um, believe it or not, we were encouraged to go out front while the Bolivians stood back. We were the ones that uh, they had uh, uh, op uh, forcing the doors open, um, addressing the traffickers that were being arrested. They were pretty much hands off. We were, for all practical practical purposes, the cops in town. When I went to Costa Rica, they were professional. They were trustworthy. They were transparent. It was like working with any police force that we would uh, encounter here in this country. Um, of course, Mexico is a different story. Mexico, especially after the Camarena area, era, um, they were intent on slowly handcuffing us as much as possible. And... Um, Going to going from Costa Rica, which is like working with another fellow U.S. cop, where they could be trusted intimately. Going to Mexico is a whole different ball game, where it was like a, a daily poker game, where we had to be careful um, not to let them know really what we were thinking. Um, all the while trying to figure out what they were thinking, and there were so many different counterparts, uh, local, state, federal. Um, that we had to deal with, that it was uh, it was tricky but challenging. So, Mike, can you tell me, I, I was always curious about this, and I, I still am always curious about this, but you being an expert in Latin American drug trafficking, why does it seem to be so violent? W what's the deal with Latin American drug traffickers, you know, cutting people's heads off and skinning them and doing all sorts of just stuff you can't imagine doing to another human being? It, it, is it a cultural thing? Why is that? Um, well, there, there, there are just a whole lot of reasons for, that's not an easy answer, but right. in, in a nutshell, south of the U.S. border, U.S.-Mexico border, the worlds change and uh, the rules change. In fact, in Mexico, in my opinion, it's lawless. There are no rules. But every, in every country, there's a different degree of, tolerance, uh, governmental, societal tolerance for violence. Uh, Colombia, of course, set the, set the tone when Pablo Escobar was uh, taking down uh, commercial airplanes just to kill one man um, that he felt threatened by. Um, um, the only thing that I can compare because of my intimate familiarity with is Mexico. Mexico is extremely violent, and what do I attribute the violence, whether it's in Mexico, Central America, uh, or South America, it's money. Uh, cocaine is probably the most lucrative uh, trade uh, business in the world. And so with money comes power, and with power comes uh, uh, absolute immunity from any wrongdoing. And, of course, we're all seeing that in Mexico. 
Okay. All right. Toward the latter half of your career, you start, and, and make sure I get this terminology right, but I think you're basically a, a SOD liaison in Mexico City. SOD for the audience is Special Operations Division within DEA. Can you explain what SOD does? SOD started out in the mid-90s um, as a, uh, a means, well, it was established in our, uh, outside of our headquarters building in an area in Virginia and was staffed with individuals who were familiar with wiretapping investigations. SOD was created to help um, guide offices, DEA offices, and uh, uh, of course DEA working jointly with other federal, state, and local agencies um, to coordinate uh, like a, a central coordination entity to take information and provide information to the various offices that could be linked to common drug trafficking targets. So an office in Miami would be in contact with an office in New York or, or, or LA uh, or wherever uh, outside of the United States going through the middleman of SOD, Special Operations Division. And SOD became a telecommunications uh, facilitator where wiretap information, for example, um, would be, be shared uh, amongst the agencies working common targets going through SOD so that we would reduce duplication of effort and extend an investigation so um, that we could ultimately dismantle an organization from top to bottom and go after the, um, the reclusive kingpins in Latin America or Mexico or wherever and take down not only the kingpins in La hiding out in Latin America, but their cells operating in, uh, uh, domestically throughout the United States. So uh, the Colombians, being smart traffickers that they were, would compartmentalize their operations. They would send out cell heads to Miami, L.A., New York, and they would operate independently. So when we would take down one cell, it wouldn't affect what was going down with the other cells. And that cell could be easily replaced. You could think about it as a tentacle on an octopus. So we came up with SOD the, to help resolve that situation. And in fact, it did um, a few years into SOD's um, SOD's operations, we were able to start taking down an entire organization from top to bottom. Okay. Okay. Um, you end up, you end your career in Houston, and I'm curious about, did you ever have any difficulties making that transition from working in a foreign country back domestically? Yes. And in, in various instances, I went from Bolivia to back to San Diego, from San Diego to Costa Rica, Costa Rica to Guadalajara, and then Houston. Working foreign cases was, uh, you know, you're getting closer to the source. When you're closer to the source, you're seeing large quantities trafficked. When I was in Costa Rica, it was not uncommon for us to seize uh, one and a half tons of coke uh, on a tractor trailer. Um, you know, working with the Costa Ricans, we were doing that routinely. So in that case, it was kind of a, an adjustment coming back to a, a street, you know, uh, enforcement uh, situation where we were targeting maybe a couple kilos, three kilos, 50 kilos, even 100 kilos was like, wow, getting a, a ton seizure um, in, in Latin America. So in that case, it was an adjustment. The other adjustment was uh, working foreign, uh, basic, with the exception of Bolivia being so actively involved. We are not police officials south of the border. We are liaison um, officials. And so we exchange intelligence. Um, yes, are we armed? In many cases, we are, but, uh, and we do so sometimes with the, the blessing of the host government, um, and sometimes without. But um, coming back to the U.S., we are 
we're cops and we have federal police powers and we are uh, uh, charged with investigating and arresting and seizing and dismantling organizations um, working with the, you know local state counterparts so in that case yeah very different plus you know the groups are larger domestically whereas uh, when you're foreign you're working in smaller, smaller groups, with the exception of large offices like Mexico City and Colum Bogota, Colombia. Yeah. Uh, for the audience, just just uh, giving you a little bit of background here. Uh, if you look at, I don't know what episode it is, but uh, there's a two part episode with uh, Larry Roberts who tells absolutely uh, crazy stories, and Mike, you were his partner. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. That word comes to mind, too, uh, because that's what we call Larry. We call him Crazy Larry. Yes, Larry was my partner uh, when I came out of Bolivia and went to San Ysidro, which was a, a border office uh, as well in San Diego. And we worked a lot of uh, cases together. And I'm sure you guys were, with, with the stories that he told, I, I'm sure you were as busy and as entertained as you could possibly imagine. Well, when we weren't, you know, chasing around crooks or going into Mexico, working again, it was time, time when we didn't have uh, agents there south of the border. So we would go into Mexico and work. But when we weren't working cases, we were either practicing karate, beating the shit out of each other, or drinking beer. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. So, Mike, two last questions I always like to ask. Did being in law enforcement affect your family? You can't help uh, when you're working narcotics at any level, whether it is, uh, you know, as a local cop, a state police, um, or fed. Narcotics is, uh, it's, uh, it's alluring, it's sexy, and it's uh, work intense. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a, for cop speak, it's a save the world kind of environment. You get in, it's good guy versus bad guy. It's a calling. Um, you're working in a group. You don't want to disappoint your partners. Um, so yeah, uh, we were always gone. We we're always working. Uh, worked hard, played hard, but there was a lot of time away from home. Uh, we would sit on a load uh, on Friday and end up following it, um, you know, cross country or, uh, following the load to seize it at the, at, the, at the other end. And a lot of time away. I'd miss anniversaries, birthdays, uh, holidays, and uh, that would slowly chip, chip away at the family. Was it a reason why cops get divorced? Uh, sometimes, but most of the time uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an added uh, factor. It is a factor. Looking back on your career, from when you first started and joined the Navy, even maybe as a kid until now, did being in law enforcement affect the way that you see people in society? Definitely. But before I answer that question, I just want to go back um, a little bit okay. and just yeah. re readdress uh, how it affected the family. Yeah. I think when I started out as a rookie, you know, I had young kids. I was so excited to get you know, put on the gun and go chase the bad guys that the kids started to grow up fast uh, without me. And the, you know, the, the secret to success in life is to live your life with as few regrets as possible. Ideally, no regrets. But I do have one regret, and that is letting my kids grow up without me. And that is because I, even though as sexy and as enticing as this job was, and feeling like we were doing all, all the good things, uh, going after uh, the scourge of drug trafficking, I missed out on my kids. And even though I have a close relationship with my children, grown adults to this day, I missed out. So I lacked balance, um, which is something I would tell a young agent to, you know, snap out of it and maintain uh, balance in life. Now, going to... Okay, wait a minute. Before you go on, I want to ask you this basically what you're talking about it i know that there's always a little bit of guilt because we're working so much and we're we're doing the job do you think if i went and asked your kids do you think that they'd feel the same way that or they'd say hey dad was doing his thing and and we never we never suffered for it 
That's a good question, and the answer, I know the answer would be, dad was doing something important, and we respected his job. He was a good dad, and whenever he could, he spent time with us. We had a good amount of family time, and there are no regrets on their end. The regrets are on my end right. as a father. Okay. So um, thank you for asking that yeah, question. Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay, so last question was, the um, do, did being in law enforcement affect the way that you see people? As a rookie, you know, go back to rookie again, mm -hmm. because there is a difference over time yeah. about how you um, look at things. So uh, starting out on the job every day, Monday through Sunday, you are chasing bad guys and you're coming in contact with them either undercover or when you arrest them you're you're you know throughout the entire investigative slash operational process you're dealing with you know uh the scrubs of society and so you develop a callus and you develop an attitude and you think everybody you're talking to uh, is scamming you, lying to you. And so <laughs> I, there were times even in church, <laughs> I would go to church and I'd be looking at uh, the priest and I, and I, you know, I'd be thinking, ah, what are you hiding? Um, that's not healthy, but that's just the name of the game. It's just a natural byproduct of being around that type of um, environment. So over, the, and a lot of times, you know, we would take somebody down and uh, we wouldn't give a shit if they got hurt or not. We wouldn't go out and purposely, you know, hurt them, but it, we didn't give a shit. And so uh, we, and we didn't care if somebody went to jail. We didn't care about their life story. We didn't care about their, their stories. As I got older, uh, I developed a little bit more compassion. I, the callus started to, uh, you know, change. And I started to become a little more sensitive to the individuals we were dealing with. First of all, when I would um, make arrests and sit down and debrief somebody, it was always easier, um, you know, to get information um, by being respectful, polite, and compassionate than it would sitting down, um, you know, being a tough guy and calling the guy an asshole. And so in that regard, I learned the value of treating people with respect, whether they were, you know, defendants or not. But in this environment, I learned to treat our crooks with respect. Now, were there evil people that didn't deserve that respect? Inevitably, we came across them. And one of them was OCL Cardenas Guillen whom I met uh, when, uh, when he ex they extradited him to Houston in 2007. But um, an absolute demonic, evil individual who probably had a lot, uh, hundreds of people killed. What's, what, g give me a little bit of background to him. Um, he was the, um, the Gulf Cartel leader um, from about uh, 2000, let's say 1998, 1999, to up until the time he got arrested in Mexico, which is 2003, and even ran his cartel from Mexican prison until he was extradited to the United States in Houston, arriving in Houston in 2000, January of 2007. He created what we determined was probably the... Uh, the, the um, he set the bar for violence by recruiting uh, a number of um, uh, Mexican Army Special Forces individuals, convincing them to uh, leave their post as, uh, as uh, uh, military uh, men and to come join the drug trafficking cause. And, uh, and that set a bar for violence that was only uh, matched years later by uh, other traffickers operating today in Mexico. So it seems to me, and, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it seems to me that over time you actually became a little bit softer, but with the knowledge that there's evil people out there. And, you know, you see, you see things as a DEA agent or as a police officer that most people in society don't see, but 
it seems like you've been able to kind of keep your humanity over your over the course of your of your life. Yes, I attribute that to balance. Um, I was fortunate enough to uh, marry um, a, a woman who uh, who also is doing the job as an analyst, and uh, and she, I attribute that that balance to uh, watching her and uh, listening to her. And of course, I was already um, a senior agent, or senior, I was a senior supervisor, and I, I was already uh, realizing that there was a sacrifice associated with this job. And even though um, I wouldn't change a thing, and I admire the agency that I work for, and I have a lot of respect for all of the individuals with whom I, I, I worked. Um, we did a lot of good things um, as a team and as an agency. Um, I, I, I do believe that the balance would have helped over the long haul. So um, I hope that answers the question. It does. Mike, thanks for the interview. Really appreciate it.